Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. My incident happened in a small town in California known as Julian. The strange thing is, I had been living up in that house by myself for over four years and had never dealt with anything like it. I didn't even believe that Sasquatch were real. It all started when I first noticed an extremely gross odor that was lingering around my property. It was so bad that I could even smell it from the inside of my house. When you stepped outside, it became even worse. My initial assumption was that it had something to do with the sewage. I knew very well what rotting animals smelled like, and this was quite different than that. Truly, it's a smell that is hard to describe. I think that's why you hear so many people coming up with all these strange combinations to describe how awful it really is. I had a few maintenance workers come out to check things out, but I was surprised to learn that they were just as stumped as I was. It had been going on for a few weeks without me being able to come to any conclusion about what the cause was. For those of you who don't know, the town of Julian is a remote mountain town. It's the type of place that attracts tourists, especially from Los Angeles, who are looking to get some relaxation and a breath of fresh air. I loved how I didn't have any close neighbors. The only time I'd ever run into anyone was when I once in a while, I would go out jogging along our street or when I ventured into town to the grocery store or pub. A place like Julian will only attract introverted residents, as there isn't a whole lot in terms of excitement. This probably sounds crazy, but it got to the point where I forced myself to get used to the smell. The reality was that I couldn't find the cause, so I had no choice but to endure the odor. Either that, or I had to move. Therefore, I essentially forced myself to carry on with life. Most of my time was spent managing a local restaurant anyway, so I didn't feel like I had any more time to put into the mystery. But as I said before, it was only a few weeks until things became more unsettling. I began to find animal skulls placed in all sorts of weird locations around my property. The skulls, which I believe in having mostly belonged to deer, started appearing all over the place. It suddenly felt as though my peaceful living space had become a place for weirdos to practice voodoo or something. Combining the awful odor with all of those bones, it was like bad energy had taken over. I was so unsure of what to do, and that was before I even discovered what was responsible for the mysteries. It was one morning when I was walking around my yard and had just removed my gloves from my back pocket to pick up another skull when I noticed something very odd in the distance. The way the sunlight pierced through the trees allowed me to see only the silhouette of a figure. It was more just like a shape, but when I saw the hands of the thing readjust its position, I knew I was looking at a living organism. I should also mention that this happened during the winter season, so I'm still perplexed as to how it was able to effectively hide for so long. By the time I spotted it, I got the impression that it wasn't concerned about being seen. There's still just so much about the phenomena that I can't make any sense of. As I stood there, trying to ascertain better what this thing was, I saw a cone-shaped head slowly rise above a set of extremely broad shoulders. While the thing sat on the ground, its feet were spread so far apart that it looked like it was doing the splits. It's like an abstract painting in my mind. 
a painting that features an extremely strange human-like being. The confusion quickly transformed to fear when I watched the figure raise one of its legs to its mouth so that it could gnaw away at it, very much like what dogs do. Only about 30 yards away from the entrance, I turned and bolted toward my house. When I got inside, I locked the door and immediately went to the bathroom. I felt like I was going to puke. I had never before felt the way I did at that moment. I didn't even have to know what the creature was to know, that I was entirely at its mercy. I don't know how I was certain, as I knew nothing about the species, but right away, I knew that that figure was responsible for the oddities that were occurring. And I'll be honest with you all, I never wanted to kill something as bad as I did at that moment, simply out of the desire to survive. Because I had no real idea of what I was dealing with, I was under the impression that a real-life monster had decided to turn my property into its home. As soon as I started to feel a little safer, I headed for my vehicle and drove to a hotel in San Diego. I could no longer imagine living in the woods. And it was that same night that I started planning my move. I never again went back to that property alone. The only times were with the realtor and the movers. Even with people around me, I was terrified to be there. Luckily, there were no further incidents. Whether that's true for the couple who purchased the house, I do not know. On to the next one. I'm going to tell you a tale about something that occurred to me and several of my friends. To give you some context, we were on a camping and shooting vacation with the Boy Scouts. We numbered between 20 to 30 in total. We were in a shack-like structure that had windows on both the front and the rear, as well as doors on both the front and back. There were wooden tables positioned in various locations across the area. In the pitch black, the adult cabin, which had the toilet, was located approximately an eighth of a mile along a dirt road. Because this was a Boy Scout activity, there was certainly a buddy system in place. It's getting close to midnight, and as is customary on camping excursions, everyone has been regaling one another with terrifying tales. Since I needed to use the restroom, I invited a buddy to accompany me, and we went together. He agreed, and then he went and grabbed our knives. We knew that there were bears in the woods, and it made us feel safer. After using the facility, we started making our way back to the cabin. This is when things started to become frightening. I had an uncontrollable feeling of dread. When I looked across at my buddy, we both had the same expression on our faces. We picked up the pace of our stroll and pulled our pocket knives out of their sheath. When I finally looked over, I noticed it. There was something big and hairy, around six feet tall, and it was bent over and walking on its hind legs. I was very scared and immediately began to flee the scene. My buddy also noticed, and together we made a beeline toward the cabin. It started producing a noise that was halfway between a groaning and a wailing, and it followed us very slowly while doing so. We started pounding on the door, and the others eventually opened it for us. They truly believe what we say we saw when we tell them what we saw. Now that the front door is secure, we turn our attention to the rear entrance. It did not have a lock. In order to ensure everyone's safety, we pressed a table against it, and stationed a child there with a knife. We covered one of the windows that didn't have blinds with a curtain, turned on all the lights, and drew the blinds on the other window that had them. The blinds didn't cover the windows, thus we were able to see the eyes outside. The monster gently moved to the rear door while all of us are now losing our collective minds. We heard it colliding with it quite a bit, maybe trying to open it, we think. After that, everything went quiet. 
but we continued to be terrified, thinking we were going to be killed. No one slept. We shared our stories with the grown-ups the next morning when they came to wake us up, and they laughed at us and stated that we were making things up. Even if they didn't believe us, we have no doubt what took place that night. On to the next one. My family and I were in the White Mountains of Arizona, looking for the perfect tree for our Christmas celebration. My grandfather was riding in the front passenger seat of our vehicle while my father drove and my mother and sister were seated in the rear seat. I was riding in the back of the vehicle with our family's German short hair pointer when the accident occurred. While we were traveling down a road that led into the forest, all of a sudden, my dog started barking and snarling. So, naturally, I turned to see what it was, speculating that it might be a mountain lion or a bear. I estimated that the distance between us was somewhere between 60 and 70 yards. What I saw was a tall, dark, hairy person strolling parallel to the road. I shouted to my dad to pull over. After I informed him that I believed I'd seen a Bigfoot, he merely laughed it off and kept driving. When I turned around to get a better look, the person had already turned around and was heading in the other direction away from the road. The monster's head was the last thing I saw before it disappeared down the hill. Even now, many years later, I'm unable to provide a satisfactory explanation for what I saw. My father usually makes me tell everyone about my experience whenever the occasion arrives simply so that he can have a good chuckle about it. On to the next one. A hunter at the Haltwood Dam in Lancaster County and York County heard a large creature crashing through the brush. The beast seemed to be aware of the hunter because when he stopped, so did it. Eventually, the hunter heard a crash to his left and saw a seven-foot-tall humanoid creature running rapidly from the direction of some gunshots that had broken the silence for a few seconds earlier. He later returned to the spot and found three toed footprints. On to the next one. A man just outside of Patton in Cambria County had been visiting friends on a remote farm out of town. He was supposed to have met his mother for a lift at 7 p.m., but had not gone down the half-mile driveway at the agreed time. Around 9.30 p.m., he made his way down the driveway, which was only suitable for four-wheel drive. He was loaned a large metal flashlight to help him. As he left the farmhouse on the Smealsberger farm, he was aware of a very strange odor in the air, like stale armpits or dirty socks. He started down the lane and felt as if he were being watched. He looked back at the farmhouse and saw a large, dark, hairy animal on the raised edge of the pond, only 80 yards away. He knew that it was watching him. The man was scared out of his wit. He decided to run down the lane, and as he did so, he began hearing crashing sounds coming from an old logging road to his left. The noise kept pace with him. By the time he got to the end of the lane, he had not heard the noise but still ran the three quarters of a mile to his uncle's house where he beat on the door and when it opened, he collapsed inside. The creature was huge and about eight feet tall. It was extremely broad-shouldered and the elbows seemed to be mid-thigh. It had long, thick arms, and the thighs and hips and rear of the animal seemed very prominent. There was virtually no neck. Hair about two inches long covered it. On to the next one. In Lancaster County in Pennsylvania, four young Amish men working in a field were suddenly approached by what they at first took to be a naked man walking with strange, bouncing steps. Suddenly afraid, they noticed that the creature had arms and legs and a face with semi-human features. It was covered with coarse, sandy hair 
and bounded along in a strange hopping motion resembling that of a strange kangaroo. Whatever that thing was, it came to within less than 100 feet of the four men, at which point one of the witnesses said he felt a stabbing sensation like an electrical jolt. He had the eerie feeling that something was inside of him. He felt strange things happen to his brain and nervous system. He could hear himself crying out, shouting words that made no sense to him. He could not understand where the words had come from. Then the creature opened his mouth and began shouting at him in the same foreign language. Eventually, the creature ran off at superhuman speed and disappeared from view on some nearby wood. On to the next one. The Frew family were living in a rented farmhouse on Route 819 in Bell Township in Westmoreland County. They began to hear strange growls and hisses from the woods. The neighbors were also hearing the noises. There were howls, growls, and cries. In spring, Sam Frew was watching television when he heard a particularly loud screech from outside. Sam ran for his rifle and a flashlight. He was tired of the noisy beast and pulled on his coat and pushed open the door, instructing his wife Ruth to close it, but stay nearby and not to open the door unless he called her. The sound was coming from a field where Sam headed. In the field, he heard a sound across the field and swerved to walk toward the sound on a path that ran along the field. He swung his torch in a wide arc and, for a second, illuminated what the family had called mystery. A four-foot-tall beast had walked through the flashlight beam. It was broad, muscular, and heavily built. It was covered with coarse hair, and the eye shone reddish-orange in the light. Sam was frightened, pulled up his rifle, and let off a shot. Mystery was only 15 yards away. There was no sound of pain. Sam reported it to the police, who sent him to a Bigfoot research group. On to the next one. A group of four young boys in Trafford in Allahanny and Westmoreland counties observed a tall, hairy figure with reddish-brown hair and red glowing eyes. They also noticed a strong, sulfur-like odor in the air and saw a strange white light in the vicinity. The creature retreated into the woods and began breaking branches and throwing stones before disappearing. On to the next one. Near Lewiston in Miffin County in Pennsylvania, I was out in the spring of the year scouting around for turkeys on the southern side of Jack's Mountain near the small village of Ellen Chapel. I heard a type of clicking sound in a thick, brushy area and walked closer to investigate. The clucking sound caught my attention because it sounded kind of like a turkey. What was odd, however, was that a turkey would let me approach that closely. As I got closer to the clucking sound, I heard a very low, guttural growl coming from the brush. I couldn't see anything. This growl really surprised and scared me. I began walking away, but then curiosity got the better of me, and I approached the area slowly again. Once again, as I got closer, the low growl occurred. Black bears are commonly seen around this area, but I can't imagine that a black bear would simply hold still that close to a human and growl. Whatever was growling at me was very well concealed because I couldn't see a thing. So, after hearing this growl two or three times, I got freaked out and left. The only other explanation I can think of, and the one I've held on to for the last 25 years, is that there was another turkey hunter out in the woods while camouflaged who was messing with me. I'd never told anyone about this incident. I started reading accounts of people online being growled at from thick brush and thought my experience might be of the same nature. It was late morning. On to the next one. I lived all my life with the Tampa area as home. I still do. 
while on a Boy Scout camp out with Troop 232 of the Good Lutheran Church on Dale Mabry Highway in Tampa at Murdoch area, the strangest smell and other non-visual clues were attributed to sulfur water. When out the second night in the distance, during initiation, R.E. and I saw something really big, really quick, moving and emitting a high-pitched scream, almost a shriek. It was running into the woods on two legs and moving very fast. It was after midnight. We had been taken out from camp by troops. As Cub Scouts, we were somewhat prepared. As Tampa Bay West Shore residents, we were little woodsmen already. And whatever that object was, we chalked up to the bigger scout. The troop master worked at the Budweiser Brewery and lived near Chamberlain. We never returned to the Glades area to initiate troop nor to even camp. When I was stationed in Vietnam, I encountered apes. About the size of the North Vietnamese, we called them rock apes, an ape that threw rocks and would sneak around the camp at night and walk around on two legs. On to the next one. Hello, I'm Anna, and I had a frightening experience with what I thought was a couple of monsters back in the early 2000s. It happened while I was walking with my father and my uncle in rural Arkansas. I had never given much attention to things like Bigfoot or the Dogman or what have you. However, I was raised in a religious household which taught me to fear demons in whatever form they might take on. And I was taught to believe that they could be anywhere at any time, but it's very rare to glimpse them in their true form. It was early Thanksgiving afternoon when my dad and uncle decided to go for a walk to have a chat while puffing on their cigars. We almost always hosted on that holiday, and a good number of my father's relatives would drive in from all over the state. We lived on quite a bit of land at the time, over 14 acres, and if I'm not mistaken, it was an amazing place to grow up but the incident on this day changed how I looked at the place. Three of us had been walking for maybe 20 minutes when we suddenly heard these creepy snarls. The noise was hair raising, and I remember rushing to my father's side before any of us even saw anything. Out from behind the trees along the dirt path came this beast. It had golden fur like a golden retriever, and its eyes were all white. Nobody said anything at first, surely because we were all dumbfounded by what we were looking at. It steadily walked a few steps toward us on all fours, displaying its long teeth and continuing to snarl. Dad, what is that? I said while gripping his hand. My voice was shaking. Go on, get out of here, my uncle said as he pretended to lunge at the creature. I don't know how he thought it would have any effect. The beast was so much larger than all three of us, combined. It didn't budge. All it did was lock eyes with my uncle, probably wondering if the guy was going to try his luck and attack it. Things got even stranger when another of the animals protruded from behind the trees. This one only a tad smaller. The second one started lightly nipping at the face of the other one, and before long, they were both standing on two feet and softly snarling at one another. They were incredibly tall when standing upright, like skyscrapers to a child. Both of the creatures looked as though they had endured recent injuries, as there were multiple patches of hair missing at random places. The only conclusion that I could come up with was that perhaps they were fighting among themselves. I don't know of anything else that could have inflicted wounds on creatures of that size. I immediately went behind my dad and continued to peek at the odd-looking animals. I started to get the impression that they were guarding something that was behind those trees, maybe a young one. It had to be either that or prey. If their main interests were to eat us, surely they would have attacked before we had time to analyze them. I could tell by my dad and my uncle's body language that they had never before seen anything like these things which made me feel even less confident that we were going to make it out of their alive. 
Suddenly, the sound of what was likely a semi-truck began to make its way into the vicinity. We weren't too far off from a long stretch of road, so the sound of a large vehicle like that was quite noisy to where we stood. For whatever reason, the noise seemed to influence the creatures to wander back into the woods. I can't say whether there was any real correlation with the noise of the semi, but it did seem as though the creatures lost interest in us. It probably became apparent to them that we were in no way looking to encroach on their territory. I remember the three of us being pretty quiet along the walk back to the house, probably due to us not only being scared, but also trying to come to terms with what we had just seen. Neither my dad nor my uncle was shy about it when we returned inside. I heard them tell many of our relatives about what had happened. A lot of our guests were probably already tipsy by that point, and they joked about everything we had said. I think everyone assumed we had made up the whole story as a way to spook the other children that had come over. I do remember many of those relatives trying to pull my leg with ghost stories and what have you, so some people must have assumed that this story was no different. To this day, I'm sure they still view it as nothing more than a prank. One of the aspects that have stuck in my head was how tall the ears of the creature were. In my memory, those ears were more like rabbit ears than dog's ears. What if these things don't have canine blood? What if they are a separate species entirely? I get why people refer to them as dog men, and whatever I saw that day did have a long snout like a wolf. But it seemed that these things were from a different world. I had trouble sleeping at night for the longest time. I kept imagining that these animals were going to find their way into the house. Luckily, we never crossed paths with them again. However, there was a time, about a year later, where a rumor was going around that a local man shot a strange animal that had allegedly been stalking him. But I never saw a picture or anything to see if it was the same thing that we saw on Thanksgiving. There were times where I contemplated being interviewed for TV shows, radio shows, and documentaries, but I always ended up shying away. The idea of watching myself or listening to myself has never been all that appealing, but I love this format, and I think it's a great way for people who like to remain private to share their reports with the world. Thanks, and keep doing what you're doing. On to the next one. In the mid-1950s, I lived in a housing project in Tampa, Florida. It was called Riverview Terrace, and it was right on the Hillsboro River next to Florida Avenue. There was a movie theater on the other side of the river called the Tower Drive-In. One evening after dark, me and a buddy were watching the movie from the projector side of the river. You could not hear the sound from the movie, but at least it kept me off the streets. I had moved over from Lakeside, Florida because my dad had been killed and my uncle was sort of keeping an eye on us. He lived near there on a street called Flora. Well, anyway, we were deep in watching the movie and we heard something behind us and we both turned and saw a large, hairy creature between us and the last lamplight the projects had to offer. It looked like the common version of the Bigfoot stereotype I see today, but back then, it looked like the common, ordinary boogeyman to us. We split and never looked back. It was clear, and there was a street lamp behind the creature. On to the next one. The Boy Scout troop I belonged to was camped on Gilcrest Island in Lake Sala Apopka in Citrus County. The day's activity included hiking, swimming, camp craft, night games, and finally on Saturday night, the ever popular campfire. The campout was very exhilarating, and when lights out came, all found it easy to fall asleep. As junior assistant scoutmaster, it was my responsibility to make sure everybody was in their tent and secure for the night. As a boy of 17 years of age, this position was one of importance and was not looked upon lightly. 
The day's duties were completed at about 11.30 p.m. I walked for approximately 15 minutes from the campsite down a moonlit path without a flashlight to take my evening constitutional. The return trip was uneventful and it seemed unusually quiet for a location normally filled with the sounds of frogs, cricket, and the occasional bump in the night. I decided to take a shortcut through the forest to bypass a bend in the trail and came into a clearing with what appeared to be a stump. I reached a distance of about six feet from the object when it stood up. The creature was six feet tall, weighing about 200 to 300 pounds. I was six foot one inches tall and weighed 120 pounds. The figure in front of me was much broader than I, with very long and heavy arms. The moonlight source was behind the creature, so consequently, eyes or facial features were not discernible. The light revealed a body glistening with long hair. For what seemed to be an eternity, but was only a few seconds, we stared at each other, and then he was gone. The creature ran with a long, fast, heavy stride as it crashed through the palmettos until it could be heard no more. The campsite was still when I returned. Frightened, I went to wake up the scoutmaster and he suggested a good night's rest and all would be well in the morning. In a separate instance at a Boy Scout camp out at Gilcrest Island, I along with other witnesses were standing in the brush when something started throwing sticks at us from the swamp area. All the Boy Scouts were accounted for. In another incident at a Boy Scout camp on Gilcrest Island, witnesses and I observed barefoot prints 12 to 14 inches long and 6 to 7 inches wide. In an April campout with a college friend, we observed at 2.30 a.m. squirrels in the treetops running about moving toward our camp, then screaming in fear above us. Then silence, followed by footsteps around our camp, followed by a loud, terrifying scream or howl, then footsteps running away. The first sighting was at 12 midnight. It was a clear, moonlit night, good weather on a cool night. Gilcrest Island is a Florida hammock island, 3,000 feet long, with a hardwood stand. The island has some swampland and is surrounded by lily pads, sawgrass, and shallow water areas. This is one of many islands in the area. On to the next one. This excerpt was taken from a traveler's diary that had been purchased at an estate sale. It was from the 1800s, and the writer's name is believed to be Reinhardt Jeff. In the course of our travels through Oregon, we learned the history of many of the men we met. I will begin with a gentleman who, to use his own words, bought a farm seven years ago. This was because he found it impossible to both raise and educate a growing family on the salary of a thousand dollars per year that he earned as a Presbyterian minister. His estate consisted of 500 acres of land, lies on the slope on the coast range towards the Williamette Valley, and he was a hundred and twenty dollars in debt after he had bought this land, with him being long since entirely debt-free. He was utterly ignorant of the business when he began and was content to imitate his neighbors for several years, plowing, sowing, and harvesting when they did. He learned by degrees to walk alone, having lost his two sons in the most hideous of events thought possible to man, saying that he had now ventured to bring much of the land that his predecessors had thought worthless for wheat into cultivation. This year that land was producing between 15 to 25 bushels per acre, while much of the wheat land yielded from 40 to 50 bushels of the same. He had a very comfortable eight-room house and a splendid 12-acre orchard full of fruit trees. This gentleman told us that he had enjoyed life to the fullest, but some years back he had fallen prey to a great depression brought about by some demons from hell. While working the harvest, his two young sons and three hired hands were in the field, with the sons being more involved in play than any work, since they were not of age for strenuous activities. From some distance, one of the hands had sighted 
two of what he described as behemoth, hairy men running in from the wood line across the wheat field towards his son. Once they had reached the youth and seized upon them, the beasts from hell retreated back to the wood line with the speed of a horse in full gallop, carrying boys kicking and screaming under their arms. By the time the help had reached the gentleman and he had gathered his wits, no small amount of time had passed. The four men retrieved a shotgun and several rifles and commenced to follow the trail through the parted wheat into the trees in swift pursuit of the hairy man-beasts. Even after searching for hours, nothing had been seen or heard. A posse of some twenty-five locals were assembled and headed back into the forest on horseback, and many more men and women joined the search. As the days wore on, the trackers came upon a trail of great prints which led them to a sense of horrific carnage beneath the pines. The youths were discovered, brawled over the high boughs of a pine many miles from the gentleman's farmstead. They seemed to have been torn apart, with many large pieces of their flesh having been bitten away. The demons had been covered in fur like that of a bear, and were of the greatest stature and girth. They seemed to spirit themselves across the field with the greatest speed and dexterity, the gentleman, a local Presbyterian, laid his only sons to rest with the community by his side. On to the next one. I'm Joseph, and I was a young man in the 1940s in the U.S. Army. This was not a good time to be in the Army, for the Second World War was raging, but I'd volunteered to go fight as much as my parents tried to discourage me from doing it. But I never ended up in the war theater at all. In fact, if anyone had placed bets on where I would end up, I'm sure everyone would have lost, because I ended up in Alaska. If you know any of the history of the famous Alaska Highway, formerly called the Alcan Highway, you'll know that it was a masterpiece of that American attitude of just get her done. There's a lot of history there, which you can look up for yourself if you're interested, but I'll tell just enough to get us going. The Alaska Highway consisted of almost 1,500 miles of road built through some of the most inhospitable country on earth. It took less than 10 months and around 27,000 men. It was truly a testament to human tenacity and engineering. After Pearl Harbor was bombed in 1941, the U.S. government got real nervous about not having any direct defense routes to Alaska. Plus, they wanted a supply route to Russia. So, President Roosevelt authorized the construction of the highway in February of 1941, and by March, the right of way through Canada was acquired. Try doing that in this day and age, and you'll understand what a huge feat just getting the rights was. Of course, Canada only stood to gain from such a highway, as it would also connect many of its remote areas to civilization. Later, after the war, we gave the Canadian portion of the highway back to Canada, though we came in later and upgraded a long portion of it. Just the bridge-building part of that job was amazing, as the construction included all these really amazing bridges across many deep and wide rivers the highway crossed. Well, I was in on it from the get-go as I had some college training in civil engineering and was viewed as a valuable commodity. When I signed up with the Army, I had no idea I'd be spending part of my time in Alaska, and I'm not so sure I would have signed up if I'd known as it was the most grueling thing I ever did. I knew I was going to be drafted anyway, so I joined. The job took 11,000 American troops, 16,000 American and Canadian civilians, and 7,000 pieces of equipment. Together, we built an average of eight miles a day through mountains, muskeg, 
and mosquitoes, and we saw quite a lot along the way. Lots of wildlife, including black bear and grizzlies, sub-zero temperatures, and a number of deaths. But what I saw one day near Talk, Alaska, was one thing never recorded in the history book. Let me explain. Building that dang highway was a pain in the you-know-what, and I was lucky to survive it. They worked us too hard, and the conditions were abominable. Morale was very low, because all we did was work, fight skeeters, and work some more. The food was inedible, and the weather was miserable. It was either dark or daylight, but sometimes not in the same day. Since we were in the land of the midnight sun, when it was daylight, they worked us even longer or harder. When it was dark, we had to work hard or we'd freeze to death. We soldiers were brainwashed into thinking we were special because we were going to save America by building a military supply route. Heck, if you saw the country we were building that highway through, you'd probably agree that the Japanese could have invaded all that inhospitable country and been the poorer for it. When we weren't fighting the weather, skeeters, or terrain, we were looking out for moose and grizzlies, both of which would rather kill you than go fishing. We had a few guys die that way, and that will sober you right up and make you keep your eyes peeled as much as you can when you're cutting through forest so thick you could walk right into a bear den before you saw it, which happened more than once. But all in all, for as unpredictable as it was, it was work you could pretty much count on. And by that, I mean you knew each morning when you got up that it would be a day of bad weather, skeeters, black flies, hypothermia, hard work, and maybe a bear encounter or two, or even more if it was summer. You could make a list of the possibilities and mark them off when the day was over, using the same list day after day. But one day, I saw something really different, something on nobody's list. I'll never forget that day, and it changed the way I did business out there. I asked to be transferred to a different position, and that may have saved my life, as it later became apparent that the location where I'd been were the ones with the highest mortality rates from bears and whatnot. The way the highway construction went was generally like this. The locators went out first, marking the way we were site surveyors, just generally choosing the best route by sight trying to avoid deep valleys and mountains and lake, that sort of thing. We'd sometimes have to climb a tree to be able to see anything. After us came the bulldozers, blazing a general trail. Then came the culvert and finish and gravel crews. We did all that at this rate of eight miles a day through wild country. As a locator, one of the things I was told to try and avoid was muskeg. What's muskeg? It's the bane of northern transportation and is mostly just another word for bog. But in the north, muskeg can be really dangerous. It's deceptive because it looks like stable ground with grass covering it. But the water table is high underneath and can really suck you in when you go out on it. I even saw a few moose trapped in muskeg during that job. They would walk out on what felt like solid ground and be sucked into it. And they like water. We actually rescued a few, but they're unpredictable and scary to work with. So a lot of guys wouldn't do that. I've seen heavy equipment sunk in muskeg, where the operator didn't realize what he was on until it was too late. Sometimes the water underneath is deep, too. There's a story that made the rounds about a train engine that disappeared completely into muskeg in Ontario. You can tell when you're walking on it as it ripples underfoot. 
scary stuff, and we hated it. Sometimes we built highways on it without knowing, as it was frozen at the time, and man, in the spring, we'd have heck to pay. So, we locators, we did our best to avoid putting the highway over it. We couldn't always avoid it, though, and that's when we built what we called corduroy roads. Basically, a corduroy road is a layer of spruce or poplar logs covered with clay or something stable. A lot of the modern Alaska highway still has a layer of log corduroy beneath the pavement, believe it or not. Anyway, now that your head is filled with all that useless knowledge, here's the rest of what I think is a very unusual story. I was somewhere in Alaska, not far from talk, out scouting the highway, totally alone in some really wild and rugged country. I mean, the whole place was wild, but this particular stretch was really something, as it was all the way up and down and boggy and hard to even see whether you were coming or going. I had to use my compass that day a lot, which I normally didn't have to do, as I usually could see out better. And to round it all out, it was foggy. I was taking a break, standing by a big tree, when I heard the most god-awful moaning, followed by what sounded a little like a bull elephant screaming in frustration and fear. Holy smokes, I'd never heard anything like that, and it literally made the forest shake. I'll admit to being scared, because I was. Well, I stood there as the sound went on and on, way too long for any human's lungs, and way too powerful for a bear or a moose's lungs. Now, I'd made acquaintances with a few of the natives. We even had some working with us, and they would always tell me to be careful not to run into a bushman. What the heck was a bushman? They would always act like they didn't want to talk about it, and they would hem and haw and say it was a big, hairy man in the bush. I thought it maybe referred to the few old trappers and such living way out in the wild. Some of them were pretty hairy, and not anyone would want to run into one in the dark. Well, that day, I was to find out what a bushman was, and I wish to this day I still didn't know. That was knowledge I would be very happy to not have floating around in my brain. I had to live with that image the entire time I was working on the highway, which was months. Finally, after what seemed like forever, the sound stopped, followed by what sounded like somebody crying. That's what got me and made me go, look, the crying sound. If it had just been the screaming, I would have been too scared. I started in the general direction of the sound, hiding and trying to be real quiet. If it was a bull moose or a big bear, I sure didn't want it to know I was around. Now, the noise turned into a moaning again, and I wasn't real sure I should continue. But finally, my curiosity got the better of me. For some reason, I started thinking about Bushmen and thought maybe I was going to see something unusual, which made me even more scared. Finally, I tiptoed up to a thicket of berry bushes. I could tell there was grass beyond, as I could see the green here and there through the branches and thorns. Sure enough, I could make out something dark brown in the greenery. It was thrashing around, but not appearing to be able to move much. I wasn't sure what to do, but I finally made a little tunnel through the brush to where I could see better. I wanted to turn and run, but my legs were too wobbly. I've never been so scared in my life, not even when I thought I was about to get run over by a train, and that's another story for another time. I actually thought I was going to pass out for a minute. The darn thing was so big and ugly, you just can't imagine it without seeing it. It dawned on me that the thing could see me as it was now very still and looking directly at me. 
This made me even more wobbly, even though I knew there was something wrong with it, and I could guess what that something was. It was stuck in the muskeg. There was no way it was going to come after me. As I stood there looking at it, I thought I could see a look of helplessness, like it was hoping I would somehow rescue it. Ugly as it was, it looked pitiful. It was in the muck, up to its hips, and looked to be slowly sinking. It had been quiet the whole time since it had spotted me, but now it held its arms out and started making a sad sound, kind of like a sip, 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 as it begged me with its eyes. I knew it was asking me to help it, but I had no urge to do so. I just kind of hoped it would go under so I wouldn't have to look at it. So this was a Bushman, I thought. No wonder nobody wanted to talk about them. I was already having queasy feelings and hoped I wouldn't be haunted by ugliness for the rest of my life. But when I stepped back and thought about it, it wasn't really any uglier than a big old grizzly. I mean, it had thick hair that draped down off its long arms, and its shoulders were big and muscular. It looked like it could easily rip me apart if it weren't stuck. Maybe it would do so if I rescued it, just rip me apart after I saved it. But those eyes, they looked so expressive, so human, and its face was human-looking, in spite of a low brow and a sort of rounded head. In fact, some of the guys I worked with weren't much better looking, I thought. Maybe they were related somehow. I was beginning to soften, even though I had no idea how I could rescue this thing. The rest of the guys were far behind me, working on the highway. I was pretty much alone. The other locator working over my right, trying to scope out a big hill and see if it could be negotiated. I picked the valley part of the potential route and was checking it out. I was all alone in this, just me and the bushman. He now began thrashing and I could see this made him sink faster. I stepped forward, saying, no, don't do that, and he actually stopped, watching me. He was now in the mud, almost to his waist. Then a thought came to me. Corduroy. I could make a corduroy bridge for this guy to roll onto and gradually pull himself out. It was a crazy idea. The thing looked way too heavy, but... I had no other ideas to try. I had decided that, ugly as he was, I couldn't just stand there and watch him die. I pushed back through the thicket into the forest and found a log, then tried to drag it through the brush and over to him. It was almost impossible, but I managed to get it to the edge of the muskeg. Last thing I wanted to do was get in there myself and think, then there would be two of us to moan and yell and holler. But how could I get the log over to him? I pushed it from its end, and he grabbed onto it for dear life and promptly pulled it under, into the bog. Well, that was a big waste of time, I thought. You dumb ox, I said, shaking my head, then went back for another log. I did the same thing, and so did he. Well, two down, and who knows how many to go. I thought, watching him sink even further. I went and got another log, then another, and another, until I could see a sort of raft starting to build up, right there next to the bushman. It wasn't quite the same as the corduroy road, since these were small logs, but it seemed to have stopped his sinking, and maybe I could build it up enough that he could climb onto it and jump out. I have no idea how many logs I dragged over and pushed out to him, some big and some small, but I had to eventually stop and catch my breath. I was exhausted. Log dragging is hard work. As I sat there by the thicket, I watched as the bushman carefully and gingerly pulled himself up onto what was now a floating log jam. The log jam started sinking but gradually buoyed back up, and 
he very slowly pulled himself out of the muck and up onto the log. It was only then that I could see how truly huge this monster was. My instinct said to flee, but I had to see if he could get out first. I couldn't leave until I knew he was okay. With the grace of an overweight ballet dancer, he slowly stood on the wobbly, sinking logjam and then unexpectedly leapt with great force, barely clearing the edge of the muskeg and landing a mere ten feet from where I sat. In fact, I thought for a minute he was going to land right on top of me. The logs went flying the other direction with force. I stood to run, then realized he could simply reach out with those long arms and grab me. Maybe it was better to stand my ground than to let on how scared I was. I was trembling, but he just stood there, practically close enough to shake my hand, all covered with mud, then softly spoke what sounded like a word or two. He then turned and left, bounding through the forest so fast I was in shock. He was too big and heavy to move that fast. I slipped back down onto the ground. How could anything be that big and move so gracefully and quickly? I finally went back to my surveying in shock for the rest of the day, afraid I would run into him again, and yet knowing I would be okay if I did. He had made no move to harm me, and in fact, I thought I'd seen gratitude in his eyes as he stood there beside me, but maybe I'd imagined it. Shoots, maybe I'd imagined the whole thing. I didn't sleep well at all that night. The next day, I walked back to the same place, and there were the logs floating on the muskeg, all scattered around from when he leaped off them, so I knew it had actually happened. It was then that I heard a deep and resounding sound coming from the bush across the valley, Awoo! And I somehow felt he was greeting me and maybe saying something like, Thanks, mister. I tried to answer back, but I doubt if he heard me, as he was too far away. But the next morning, I found a beautiful rock next to my tent, a small piece of gray granite, all infused with pink and green stripes that reminded me of the northern lights, and I knew it was a gift from the bushman. I slept well after that, but I was always on the lookout for more of them. I can tell you that, and I was happy when the job was done and I could leave Alaska. Very, very happy. And I still have that rock. On to the next one. Steve and Jean Fitzgerald and their children, Dan, 16, and Gloria, 9, were camping in a very remote area of the Cascades. They saw Bigfoot several times, which were apparently curious and often watched the family, generally coming around at night. Once, when Jean was out gathering firewood, she found herself face to face with a Bigfoot and fainted. On to the next one. In Grant County in Oregon. This is in the Three Sisters range of the Cascades. I saw what I first thought was a woman on top of the hill across the street from our house. You cross the street, go through about 20 yards or so of poplars or the like, and then go up a steep trail. It was on this trail where it stood. The silhouette was featureless, except that now I noticed that the hair covered the entire body and not just the head. I could see no facial features. It was a dark reddish brown as the sunlight from the sunset behind it lit it up. It stood there for a good minute or so, turned and walked away. I ran into the house once it had gone and screamed to everyone what I had just seen. Later, my parents went atop the hill and found footprints. Not sure about the size, the area is mountainous to rolling hills, with sparse pines, some stands of what I think of now as poplar or skinny, straight, thin birch. The house was up a hilly road and near town. 
in the Three Sisters Mountains, we have seen footprints going across the highway. When I was taking a leak one time, I noticed that there were footprints in the sand going into the woods. I got scared and jumped into the front seat. I was very young, but I knew they belonged to a Bigfoot. Then Mother calmly made us get out, and we looked at the tracks as about the size of a man size 9 or 10 foot. This was in the Three Sisters Mountain Range between Bend and Eugene, Oregon. This is a thick rainforest type area, thick, wet, and lots of vegetations. My wife saw three Bigfoot scaling a steep hillside around the border of Utah and Wyoming. There was one of them that waited. As it waited, it turned around its whole body, not just a simple neck turn and a little shoulder like humans, but a lot of its shoulder and a little neck. It was a full moon with snow on the ground. They were a hundred yards or so from the highway. My grandmother saw one looking into her cabin outside of Eureka, California. She says that its eyes reflected blue and they seemed that they contained all the knowledge of the world in them. That's how she described it to me. A friend of mine from Michigan said when he was younger, he and his parents had to stop on the highway one night because they had a big, hairy Bigfoot in the road, and it did not move for a good moment before it ran off into the woods. My mother heard screams from another house we owned a half a mile as the crow flies from where my sighting occurred, and they are described by her as loud, guttural, mournful, deep, but also raspy, as though you could hear it take in the air. She has seen some footprints outside of Eugene, Oregon. On to the next one. Near North Fork in Clackamas County in Oregon. Just before this incident happened, the dogs awoke and started to bark for a few minutes. Then their barking became a whine and then a whimper. They just lay there, shaking, and became very quiet. I woke up, and I quietly moved my hand to my handgun under my pillow. That's when you could hear something walking in the water that smelled like a bucket of wet diapers or urine-soaked fur. We kept our eyes shut and pretended to be asleep until it was gone. The incident lasted about four minutes. Whatever it was, brushed up against my hair as it slowly walked by. I thought I was going to die, especially after what we saw in the sand and all around the camp as soon as day broke. Very large footprint indentations made in dry, coarse river beach sand. They were usually large prints left in wet sand, but very mashed up. Similar tracks were all around the area we slept around the campfire, coals in the tent area. It was 2.30 on a Sunday morning. Conditions were summer-like, but cool in the evening because of the area. The area was a sandy shore 50 feet from actual water. It was a small clearing, but very bushy with lots of trees. To get to the area used by campers and backpackers on a regular basis, you must climb down a hard trail from the gravel road to the ghetto area. On to the next one. In Curry County in Oregon, my brother, myself, and two other men were working at a cable logging site decking logs in Forest Service land north-northeast of Brookings, Oregon. My brother and one of the other fellows, a hook tender, were working in the rigging. Myself as a chaser and the other fellow, a yarder engineer, were working in the landing. Communications between the landing and the brush were via handheld walkie-talkies. The guys in the brush spotted something moving across a prairie about 2,500 feet away, across the canyon from the yarder. They thought it might have been an elk, but weren't sure. After telling the yarder engineer about it and asking what he thought it was, the engineer had me get a rifle with a scope out of the crummy so as to have a better look. Both the yarder engineer and I took turns 
looking at this creature through the rifle scope for about 15 minutes. We both came to the conclusion that the creature was not a bear, elk, deer, or any of the commonly known big game animals that inhabit these woods around here. The creature was definitely walking upright and on two legs. It had broad shoulders, reddish brown colored hair, and it didn't seem to be in a big hurry getting to where it was going. I could see its arms swinging as it walked and seemed to have a pointed or conical shaped head. I couldn't distinguish the facial features as it was just too far away. The creature was headed in an east-northeast direction from us quartering up the hill across the prairie toward the ridge of the hill. We watched the creature until it disappeared over the ridge it was headed toward. On our way home after work, we debated what the creature was and concluded that it was a Bigfoot. The boys in the brush said that they had the feeling that they were being watched for a couple of days and the hook tender mentioned that he had heard noises like sticks breaking and something walking in the brush while he was working at his duties in the back end of the unit. At the time when he heard the noises, he just passed it off as a bear or other game animal. He never mentioned anything of strange odors or the like. There were no tracks, odor, hair. One witness heard noises, sticks breaking, and something moving through the brush in the forest at the back end of the logging unit. The sighting occurred in early afternoon or late morning. The sky was overcast with sun breaks, but not raining. It was grassy prairie surrounded by most older growth, Douglas fir and tan oak forest, about 800 feet to 9,000 feet elevation near the ridge. There were several reports in the Brookings Gold Beach area in the past 30 years or so. One of my son's friends brought over a photo of a large track with toes in the snow he found before Christmas. My good friend's 12-year-old grandson says he saw a Bigfoot step over a guardrail just a couple of nights ago. I haven't had a chance to talk to the lad yet, but I will soon. I also had an incident that happened to me a while back while deer hunting. I never got a visual of the critter running on two feet. What was really strange about it was that whatever it was made a really loud vocalization. It sounded like a monkey, a really loud one. I heard a similar vocalization on one of the Bigfoot websites and it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up when I heard the recording. I've been hunting these woods for a very long time and have heard every game animal's vocalization at one time or another, and it was not from anything I had heard before. Whatever it was made the vocalization as it was running through the heavy timber and thick underbrush. On to the next one. in the Wolf Creek area at an isolated swimming spot between Wolf Creek and the Rogue River in Josephine County in Oregon. Two people were skinny dipping when one saw a head peeping over a fallen log 60 feet away. She looked up and the head disappeared behind the log. The head was huge with brownish hair and it moved like an animal and not like a human. She yelled out to her friend to get out of there fast when she saw the head, shoulder, arm, and upper torso of a very tall creature standing upright and melting back into the trees. It was not a bear or a human. On to the next one. In Umatilla County in Oregon, I was pheasant hunting and was coming home before dark and I was just past Pilot Rock Cemetery that is in the country. I was on a little ridge that takes me home to the house. I did not see anything for all I can see all the way to the highway from there. Then I looked over to my left and there was someone walking towards the mountain and here it was getting late. It was about a quarter of a mile from me. The dark figure that looked like a guy walking, but his arms were longer than normal for a person. 
I hollered at it, and it turned and looked at me. When it turned, it moved its whole top half of its body. I hollered, hey again, and it didn't look at me. I watched it for about 15 minutes till it was out of sight from me. I was not scared, for I was well armed with the shotgun. The funny thing was that first I did not see it, then there it was, I think it was just lying down hiding, and then it jumped up and started walking away. I can't tell you how tall it was, for there was nothing to compare it to out there. But it did walk fast and was out of sight a mile away in 15 minutes. And I never thought to look for any tracks. I saw nothing before or after, but I did install a light on the back of the house to shine into the field. It was just me alone. I was pheasant hunting, but had not seen or shot any birds. It was about half an hour before dark weather and was clear and nice. It was in the middle of a wheat double field with a small ravine between the two. My dad and brother heard something in the mountains at two different places. One was about 16 miles from Pilot Point when they were deer hunting and the other was by Anthony Lake area. They didn't see anything, just heard a weird laughing grunting. On to the next one. This was to be our fourth fishing adventure in Wyoming. The region contains some of the best fly fishing and wilderness hiking in the world, and it is breathtaking country. After our first trip, we had quickly learned that it is well worth your time and money to work with a good outfitter or guide service when you are planning to go into such areas. In most, if not all, situations, you will need some type of permit and or licenses, and the area knowledge of local men or women is a valuable asset which cannot be measured in dollars and cents. This is not the time or place to be cheap. For the price of a Hawaiian vacation for two, you can be readily supplied with everything and anything you will need, including a guide. In doing so, you are not only helping yourselves, but you are supporting an industry and a people in the region, which will help ensure that these resources will be in place for a very long time into the future. We met up with our guide, Joseph, at a predetermined location. He was a slightly built, rugged-looking man who was of pure Arapaho heritage, and his family had been in this region for many generations. We were to hike and fish in two different areas. The first site that we would fish was named Big Meadows, and the second along the route would be Downs Fork Meadows. There is a creek running right through this area, which changes its name periodically as you trek. The only name I can ever remember is Dinwoody Creek, simply because of the name and its European roots. The area consists of a rocky, mountainous surround with pine forests, grassy meadows, and water. That's Wyoming, and that's why we love it. Each time we come to this state, we prospect a new area. So this particular location was brand new for the two of us. We each were given a holstered pistol and Joseph had a rifle and a pistol as well. This is grizzly country and there are plenty of visible herd animals and trout as well, which the bears are itching to sink their claws into, so it was eyes wide open from here on out. The entire area that we plan to pass through is similar throughout, full of thick, grassy meadows and marshy areas surrounded by extremely rugged timber. Rocky, mountainous terrain rises up behind the tree line, with the land's appearance being the same in every direction that you looked. This trip was in no way particularly difficult and the actual mileage covered was not very far. It was more a casual hike, with most of our time spent focused on catching trout. We hiked in and set up camp on the edge of Big Meadows. 
From where we were in the timber line, we had a good, firm patch of ground on which to pitch a tent, with our camp being within a reasonable walking distance across the meadow for us to reach the creek. Right behind the stretch of forest where we had set up our camp was a small mountain jutting up from the earth, and across from the creek was a lake. During the first two days, we spotted a grizzly coming down across the meadow. It posed no threat to us, and was fairly far away each time we saw it. We also saw a moose grazing on the thick green grass, and I had told Alistair on more than one occasion that having a guide brought a certain sense of stability to us whenever we saw something. Joseph was not by any means flustered by a predator that might have otherwise frightened us to death. He had a mutual respect for the surroundings and its inhabitants, which is not to say that Joseph was foolhardy or lax in any way. He simply was not visibly moved by them. One afternoon, we were lined up side by side, fishing from the bank of the creek. We all faced in the direction of a small lake which lay to the northwest. Next to the lake, there was an outcropping of rock which butted up against it, which appeared like a rugged hill or mound. At most, it was 200 feet tall, which was much smaller than the surrounding mountainous landscape. Marjorie and I were standing with our eyes focused on the creek when Joseph suddenly said, Look over there! right by the edge of that hill. Do you see it? We both turned our heads and looked, trying to follow the direction of Joseph's point. He spoke again. Do you see it? It's a hairy man. Now, Marjorie and I were not ignorant of what he was talking about or pointing at. Although neither of us had seen one, we knew he had to be talking about a Bigfoot. As we focused in on the base of the mound, there it was loping along the edge of the hill adjacent to the marsh. Once we laid eyes on it, it was very easy to observe, since it was completely out in the open. It must have come out of the woods that lay a short distance north of our camp. It had to have walked right across the meadow while we were fishing. We hadn't seen it, and yet there it was, I would say that it was five or six hundred yards away, and the creature's iconic silhouette was unmistakable. The marsh or meadow area consisted of bright green grass that was about two feet tall, and the grass was especially green along the water's edge where it abutted the rocky outcropping. There were no trees to obscure our view and the Bigfoot's profile was very dark against the rocky background since the rocks were beige in color. Its arms swung like a clock's pendulum as it took long and deliberate strides, and it walked with a somewhat forward-leaning posture, which was quite evident to the eye. Within two minutes, it disappeared beyond the bend and was gone from our view. And we had just become members of the Believers Club. Pardon the pun, but this was a really big deal for me and my wife. So the rest of the day was spent with the three of us talking about Bigfoot. Around the campfire that night, Joseph started telling us of the Native American folklore that pertained to these hairy men. He had actually personally seen the creatures many times, but he was as surprised as we were to catch sight of one on that particular day. However, it was still more routine for him than it was for us. During the night, Joseph added that we should keep our eyes out for the hairy man while we were here. He said that throughout history, the native people had experienced and spoke of some really bad things regarding these creatures. Their tribal record mentioned many encounters including attacks on people, livestock, and even unexplained disappearances. Because of his tone, we became certain that he was unhappy that this sighting occurred. That evening, I also took note of the fact that he spent a fair amount of time cleaning and prepping the guns. The next day, 
we packed up and walked to the back of the lake where the Bigfoot had disappeared from view. Joseph said that area was where we could pick up on Glacier Trail. Without the trail, we would have to trek entirely through the woods to get to the next location. From there, we would make our way north to an area called Downs Fork Meadow. I wouldn't have known the path was there without a professional like Joseph to guide us. Now, I would be a liar if I didn't say to you that when we started down this route, things became a whole lot creepier. Not just because of what we had seen, but because this trail area became quite a bit tighter. Everything had closed in around us. Large stands of timber flanked us on both sides, and some rock wall cropped up here and there, forming what felt like a prison cell around us. As I remember, it was a curvy trail, and at any given point, it was difficult to see very far ahead of us. I kept thinking of old westerns where the Indians would set up an ambush on some unsuspecting cowboys positioning themselves behind some boulders up on a cliff. No offense to Joseph. To get to Dinwoody Creek, we went straight through dark stands of trees, after which we found ourselves winding around some more ambush points, or high rocks. As we came out of the trees, we found ourselves near a fork in two creeks, the Downs Fork Creek and the south end of the Honeymoon Creek. This was quite a cool little area. There were several meadows with a number of creeks or streams meandering around them. They were like small tributaries off the main creek, and the meadow had several stands of trees spotted within them. I know I speak for all of us when I say that this place really struck us in the most amazing way. We felt like Alice going down the rabbit hole and popping out in Wonderland. Now, just so you understand, Joseph's job was not to fish. In fact, we had asked him numerous times to join us with a rod, and he politely declined every time. He would spot for us or get in the creek and help us with landing a fish, and he also paid strict attention to other things, like setting up our flies and leaders. In Down's Fork, however, he was seemingly preoccupied with his field glasses. When I asked him about this, he said this was grizzly territory and that it would be best for all of us if he kept watch. We didn't argue with him. He was our guide, so he knew best. During the latter part of the afternoon, something let out the loudest, most prolonged howling roar that is humanly imaginable, sounding like a fire department siren. The howl was as intense as you could possibly imagine, and it sounded really close. I looked around in all directions, but I could see nothing except for thick forest. Truth be told, the sound seemed like it was emanating from all around us, rather than in any particular place. It was the loudest, most enveloping blast of noise that I had ever heard in my life, and it brought us to a complete standstill. We stood there, completely aghast. Our jaws were hanging open, and Joseph had already brought his rifle to bear. Following his example, we dropped our rods and grabbed our pistols. The sound stopped, and then we heard nothing. We held our ground, turning in every direction while not saying a word. It seemed like 15 minutes had passed before Joseph finally broke the silence. He turned toward us and whispered, The hairy man is here. I remember thinking to myself that even when holding a gun, one can sometimes feel defenseless, and I've never felt more vulnerable. As far as I was concerned, whatever had made that noise could eat bullets and spit them back out again. We had a momentary discussion about the best course of action, and then we started back out the way we came in, working our way through the trees, ambush points, and everything else. This time, we were like jungle fighters, looking around corners with our guns first. We hightailed it all the way back to camp 
and nobody said anything about needing to drink or eat. It was all about moving and moving fast. There must have been about two miles south of the big meadows when we broke out into an area that felt less secluded. We could see in virtually every direction and had decent visibility. We knew that, like it or not, we would have to spend the night, and this was the place to set camp. When I tell you we had an uneasy night, that is an understatement. Nobody could sleep, and regardless of what my wife and I did, Joseph felt it was his duty to be awake and standing guard. The minutes seemed like hours, and I kept waiting for a bonsai attack, but nothing happened. In the morning, we finally took the time to eat. We were all hungry, and we'd need all our energy in order to finish the final stretch of the journey back. To this very day, we still send Joseph a Christmas card to let him know we are thinking about him. As for my wife and I, we have not been back to Wyoming in over 15 years, and we don't plan to go back anytime soon. On to the next one. Deer hunters are often prime witnesses to Bigfoot activity in any given state. They're usually in the thickest part of the woods, well before daylight, sitting silently in tree stands 15 to 20 feet above the forest floor, well camouflaged right down to their scent, awaiting their unwary prey. Although some of them might not admit it to just anyone, more than a few brave Kentucky hunters have been scared out of the woods on occasion. Anderson County is particularly rich in such stories. A huge creature, some eight feet tall and covered with long, tangled brown hair, was seen emerging from a large cedar thicket just before dusk in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. The witnesses, a Mr. Lynn Hutton and his eight-year-old son, bolted for the safety of their truck when the monster stepped suddenly back into the wood. They could hear it following them, though, they claimed, and wasted no time exiting the area of Bod Mill Road. The appearance of the thing was just as I had seen on TV. Stories and descriptions I have heard, the witness stated. As far as the behavior of it, it was very shy, as it appeared not to want to be seen. My son and I have been deer hunting on a local farm. When it came time to leave, we met up and started back to my truck. The two had walked only about 50 yards down the path when things took a dramatic turn for the surreal. They heard what sounded like something large coming out of the cedar thicket. Then we both saw it. It stood approximately eight feet tall and had long brown hair all over. We stopped, and it stopped at the same time. We didn't know what to say or do. They were both relieved when the hulking figure stepped back into the thicket and disappeared. We got back to my truck as fast as we could, but... We could hear something following us the whole time. Luckily, the creature never stepped out again from its concealment. I haven't told too many people about this, the witnesses claimed, because they always laugh at us or start making jokes. I know I'll never forget it as long as I live. It was really scary. That thing was huge. The two had been hunting on a 100-acre farm near Bypass 127, when the sighting took place. When interviewed later, they both said that it appeared as if they startled the creature. The creature was walking toward them on a path and gave a small jerk when it sighted them. There was no associated odor with the creature. They described the hair as being dirty brown, tangled looking, and messed up, the father's words. The son said the hair looked like it was in dread. Both witnesses said no facial details were visible due to the long hair hanging down into its face. The father estimates the body hair to be about eight inches long. The arms hung to below knee level. The father estimated the weight to be about 300 plus pounds and described it build as bigger than the biggest football player, but not fat. Neither witness could see anything to indicate gender, the son assumed it was male. 
The father described the creature's stance as being very upright, not hunched over, almost at attention. Both witnesses agreed that the thing had quietly walked backwards until it came to the cedar where it had turned and re-entered the thicket. The father described the creature's gait as being just like a man's. Years later, Hutton appeared on a local documentary concerning the mysteries of the area and spoke of his encounter. My name is Lynn Hutton, he began. I live in Anderson County in Kentucky. I've lived here most of my life. I'm 57 years old. I was deer hunting with my son. He was eight years old at the time. We were bow hunting, but I had an illegal firearm, a pistol under my coveralls. I don't like to go into the woods without one for many reasons. It was close to getting dark, and I told my son that we better get back to the truck before it got too dark. All of a sudden, about 20 feet from us, there's no other word to call it, a Bigfoot stepped out from the cedar trees. Hutton grabbed his son and pushed him behind him and to one side while he locked eyes with the hairy monster. The two stared for a couple of seconds, and by the time that I realized I'd better get my gun out, fortunately, the creature then backstepped back into the cedar thicket it had stepped out of, never taking its eyes off the two hunters. Thoroughly unnerved, Hutton grabbed his son and wasted no time getting back to his vehicle. When we got back to the truck, we got in and left, and I haven't been back since. When asked to describe the creature, he claimed that it was very tall, thick and heavy looking, covered with long, matted, dark-colored hair. Its face was the same as its whole body, covered in long hair. You could make out its eyes and mouth, not so much the nose. The hair was just real long and at least a foot long over its body. It never took its eyes off us. Never, not once. It just stepped out of the cedars. We looked at each other for a second or two. Then it just stepped right back in. Neither Hutton nor his son noticed any smells in association with the sighting. I was so scared, I didn't notice anything else. My son didn't either. Him being eight years old, it didn't scare him as much as it did me. He didn't have any idea what it was. I knew what it was as soon as I saw it. It had to be. It just couldn't have been nothing else. It was just like looking at a big ape. It was massive, just huge. I'll never forget it. It scared me so bad, I'll remember it for the rest of my life. Hutton seems unconcerned with anyone who might call him crazy or ridicule his experience. They can laugh at me all they want, he said. It was real. I would walk into any church, put my hand on a stack of Bibles, and swear to God that what we saw was real. Another Anderson County encounter took place in November in Lawrenceburg. I was deer hunting off Wildcat Road on the edge of an old field, stated the witness. When I heard something large crashing through the woods toward me on the other side of the field, not a deer, it sounded much bigger, and deer don't snap off branches and large sticks the way this thing was doing. Just before it would have entered the field where I could see it, the thing stopped and issued the loudest, scariest scream I have ever heard, and I've been roaming the woods for over 40 years now. The best description I can give would be somewhere between an elk bugling and a wild pig squealing, and it sounded angry. I know that's applying human attributes to it, but that's just how it sounded. That first scream lasted maybe five to ten seconds. Then another scream began, and I heard whatever it was crashing through the woods back in the direction it had come from, moving very fast, and continuing that second long scream. It was moving fast. It was moving so fast that you could hear the sound of the scream fade as it moved away kind of like the whistle of a train. I could hear it maybe 15 to 20 seconds before the scream and crashing faded away. The witness claimed that his dog always became frightened when he took them out by the old tobacco barn on the property and that he'd once found a large pile of scat full of fur and possibly persimmon seeds that he couldn't identify. In July of 2006, 
another passing motorist got a glimpse of the elusive creature as he was driving down a lonely road in Lawrenceburg at around 11 p.m. I was driving down a back road, said Zachary, and as I came over a hill, I saw a big animal on the side of the road. As I slowed down to see what it was, it slowly walked across the road. I went home, and right away my mom knew something was wrong. I was pale and was soaked with sweat. Zachary claimed that the figure was very tall and black, and he is sure that it wasn't a bear or other animal native to the region. He also noted that it had long arms and walked slowly. I swear on it, I saw what I saw. Another Lawrenceburg hunter, Aaron, got a pretty good scare just before dawn on the cold, foggy morning of December. As he walked to his deer stand near Wildcat Road, it was about 6 a.m., when I heard footsteps behind me. I then heard what sounded like screaming, real low-pitched sounding, almost a growl. I got to the stand and climbed up. For about ten minutes, whatever this thing was, it circled the tree I was in and made these sounds. I would have shot at it, but I never could see it because of the dense fog. I don't think that it was any animal I know of. I stayed there until about 10 a.m. and then left. On the trail back, I noticed there were branches broken off about chest high, and I felt like something was watching me the whole way. The witness also recalled that he smelled a terrible skunk smell while the creature was in the area. During the previous summer, he had camped in the same area on a farm near Wildcat Road and smelled the same smell and heard what sounded like footsteps tromping around the campsite late at night. He was so frightened, he claimed that he would not look outside his tent. I wouldn't either. He doesn't feel safe going back there without a gun at any time of day, he now claims. Bigfoot investigator Philip Benser wrote about a series of unexplained events which took place in Anderson County near Panther Rock in The Wild Man of Kentucky, and later a documentary of the same title. Spencer, a native of the area, even claims he found human-like footprints measuring 20 inches in length near Panther Rock and that he and a group of friends actually observed the creature standing along the edge of a field near a herd of deer one evening. According to him, one afternoon, a young boy and girl while walking near the Salt River unexpectedly came upon a huge, hairy, man-like creature sitting on a log. They claimed, even while sitting down, the creature was taller than a grown man. The incident allegedly frightened the family so badly they ended up moving away from the area. Another Anderson County resident admitted to Spencer that he'd had many sightings and encounters with the monster over the last decade. He told of hearing his dogs raising hell one night and stepping outside to see what was going on. He could see his three dogs apparently fighting with something significantly larger than they were across a field and just at the edge of his light. The figure, which seemed to have a low-hanging belly, swatted at the dog as it retreated into the wood. The dog, still fighting, followed the beast. The witness chose to go back inside. The next day, he found two of his dogs beaten and bloodied in their pens. No trace of the third dog was ever found. According to him, he also heard anomalous nocturnal animal noises, which he could not identify many times over the last 10 years, and has even managed to record some of them. Many other residents of the area have made similar claims. In 2007, a local farmer and his son heard strange sounds in the creek near their house. The sounds were like deep breathing and a large creature walking in the creek. The next day, a 20-inch human-like track was found in the creek bed. At about the same time and area, another witness, Bruce Young, and a friend claimed they saw the creature moving along the top of a hill while they were driving toward Hammond Creek Road. It was just after sunset, he said, but still plenty enough light to see the thing. He described it as a seven-foot-tall or more massively built, hairy, man-like creature. For 30 seconds, he stood watching it from 50 yards away, 
and got goosebumps when he realized what he was seeing. The figure moved along at an easy gait and was covered with long, dark brown hair. In the eastern part of the country, just a few miles away from Panther Rock, another man-like monster is rumored to haunt the Cedar Brook area. This creature is said to have glowing red eyes, is prone to startling late-night lovers, parked on lonely roads, and is called the Cedar Brook's Howdy, or simply Red Eyes. The creature's powerful, mournful nocturnal wails are often heard in the night there and is said to make every dog in town howl in fear at once. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, Thank you so much, and until next time, bye!